that on. Uh, thank you, General Nambio. Yeah, we've gone from, I think we'll go from uh, submarines to aircraft carriers. So uh, that's, that's, that's in, indeed my topic. First, I want to thank uh, IDSA uh, for in inviting me, especially uh, General uh, Gupta and his, his colleagues for uh, um, making, making this all, all possible. It's a great uh, honor to be here before this distinguished audience. Um, I need to make a quick disclaimer that uh, what I'm about to say and the contents of my paper represent only my views and those of my co-author, not those of the RAND Corporation or any of its uh, sponsors. Um, of course, aircraft carries only one dimension of a larger, uh, larger naval, uh, naval modernization, um, that's uh, trends in naval modernization that are uh, unfolding across, uh, across Asia. You know, some have suggested that Asia's experience seeing some sort of arms race. Uh, uh, Jeffrey Till uh, says that uh, Asia's navies are modernizing at an unprecedented rate. So whether or not it constitutes an arms race, I'll leave to other academics. I was going to say leave it to the academics, but I'm an academic, so I can't, I can't, I can't get myself off the hook if I, if I don't qualify it uh, that way. But what we are seeing, I think, as... Uh, uh, Admiral Otto's uh, uh, presentation un underlined is uh, uh, a growing, uh, increasing acquisitions of naval assets uh, by uh, countries uh, throughout uh, the Asia Pacific uh, region. Aircraft carriers are expensive, complex systems of systems that few countries uh, can afford, let alone. Uh, possess the infrastructure and the expertise and technology to build them. I think uh, growth, so we, we're talking about fewer countries that are a able to engage in uh, what, what uh, probably doesn't constitute an arms race, but certainly some kind of, uh, certainly some kind of military buildup. You have a fewer number of countries that can participate in any, uh, any uh, possible uh, aircraft carrier um, race or buildup in Asia. Uh, but I think it's significant that while acquisitions of aircraft carriers around the world is, is, is flat, in, it's in Asia where the action is. Notably, of course, in India and China. India is uh, publicly uh, committed to a three-carrier uh, navy. Uh, China, of course, com um, commissioned its first carrier in September of, of 2012 and appears likely to develop uh, between two and four additional carriers in coming decades. Uh, we could even, we could possibly, some people mention uh, Japan in the same breath. Uh, the uh, destroyer Izumo um, is, of course, a helicopter, uh, officially a, a destroyer, a helicopter, uh, carrying helicopters. But as some people have pointed out, it, it's possible uh, to reconfigure uh, the that uh, vessel uh, as uh, to allow for uh, for aircraft uh, aircraft operations. So, what's driving these uh, these programs? I'm not going to look at all these programs. I'm going to look at uh, one in particular. Focus on China. So, my paper um, provides an overview of the development of the aircraft carrier program in that country, China. I try to identify some of the drivers, um, the strategic intentions, and the operational capabilities that may come uh, from. Uh, that to carry a program. Uh, before I, I dive in um, to my paper, uh, make a, an observation. One of my RAND colleagues remarked to me um, a couple of weeks ago that it seemed ironic to him that China, a country that has perhaps contributed most uh, to moving aircraft carriers towards obsolescence, has now embraced that same vessel. Of course, uh, what, what, I'm, what, we're, what we're referring to is the development of, of uh, advanced military technologies uh, that make aircraft carriers essentially, uh, I won't call them sitting ducks, let's call them floating ducks. So uh, the rest of my time, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about uh, drivers, what I, th what I think are, are dri is driving uh, the aircraft carrier program in China talk a little bit about uh, uh, China's uh, strategic intentions and then the operational capabilities uh, uh, that are desired. 
there have been three main uh, drivers uh, identified by different authors who've studied uh, China's aircraft carrier program. Uh, the first one is uh, a bureaucratic uh, a push uh, by the People's Liberation Army Navy um, to uh, increase its uh, political power and influence and emphasize the importance of uh, China's, uh, the, the maritime rel realm to China over the past few decades. Um, a second uh, driver that's been identified is Chinese nationalism. A uh, famous article in International Security, China's Naval Nationalism. Uh, certainly, um, that seems to be a, a big uh, part of this. It's a, it's a major prestige project. Uh, aircraft carriers are seen as a major accoutrement of a, of a, a major power. And uh, so, certainly a lot of, a lot of pride uh, in uh, a country that, uh, when your country can, uh, uh, can develop and, and, uh, and operate a, a carrier. The third, uh, the third um, driver that's been identified by scholars is uh, uh, a, that it's part. It's driven by a coherent maritime strategy. That, uh, in other words, there's a there's a, a logic to acquiring aircraft carriers beyond simply uh, feeling proud to be Chinese or Indian or uh, or uh, the. Uh, influence, rising influence of a particular uh, bureaucracy or set of bureaucracies. What uh, I suggest, what my co-author and I suggest in our paper that uh, um, the critical driver was, was strategic, uh, but we adopt, we argue for a combination of, of factors that uh, was driving China's uh, ca carrier program. Nationalism certainly being an important contextual factor, and lobbying by uh, PLA uh, Navy uh, leaders also being important. Um, but this was a very long and drawn out uh, uh, process to develop a carrier program over many decades, and so this this suggests uh, I think the importance of the strategic logic. And it really ties in to the end, end of the, I, I think, to the end of the Cold War, when the logic uh, of an aircraft carrier became um, much more, much more important. Up until that time, uh, China's uh, main uh, strategic direction, or main concern of uh, threats, was on the, uh, on its land borders, continental, uh, continental th um, threat uh, from from the, the Soviet Union in, in particular. So as I mentioned, the origins of the uh, program uh, go back uh, many, many decades. And I think it's important to note that the PLA Navy has been uh, a relatively weak service in, in the uh, Chinese armed forces, uh, especially compared to the ground forces and even perhaps to the, to the Air Force. And so uh, arguing that point alone, uh, bureaucratic interests is... Uh, a bit uh, seems seem on its own seems implausible, but here it's important to note one one individual that's intimately identified with with the genesis of this uh, of, of the carrier program. That's uh, the late Admiral Liu Huaqing. Uh, he's considered the most uh, important dogged uh, champion of the program. He's he's been dubbed uh, the father of China's aircraft carrier. He's also been dubbed uh, China's Mahan. So. Uh, a key figure and uh, not um, it's uh, I think it's no coincidence that he is he is also uh, the most powerful single military leader in the post Mao era and when he you know he was the last individual uh, in uniform to serve on the Politburo Standing Committee and he stepped down in 1992 so he's one man but he's one man that had a heck of a lot of influence in, uh, in, in Chinese military politics. Uh, uh, so there were uh, fleeting glimpses, uh, hints that uh, China was developing, a, a, a interested in developing a carrier program, but probably the biggest hint uh, came in a, 
in the late 1990s when over a three year period China bought three aircraft carriers um, uh, of course they were not in totally good shape um, basically uh, most of them were, were basically halts but a country does not buy three aircraft carriers um, in, in that short amount of time. Uh, the estimated value uh, cost of these carriers together, uh, not huge uh, for any military budget, but uh, still a statement of intent over 30, uh, 30 million, uh, 33 million US dollars uh, for those three aircraft carriers. So this was an effort uh, to study uh, and uh, learn as much as, as China could uh, from these uh, foreign, uh, foreign uh, 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 carriers. To the best, of, uh, best I can tell, the actual decision uh, to go ahead with uh, the, the uh, uh, development, uh, the construction of a, of a carrier using one of those uh, uh, foreign uh, hulks that they acquired, China acquired, uh, was made in 2004 or 2005 uh, by the uh, Central Military Commission. In terms of the, the overarching uh, strategic logic, I just want to draw your attention to two, um, two uh, different strategic articulations that I think were particularly important in uh, um, moving China towards actually uh, uh, acquiring uh, an aircraft carrier. The first uh, was uh, in the uh, early 1980s, Admiral Liu Hua Cheng um, is uh, widely credited uh, with developing a, a road map of sorts for China's uh, maritime and, and, uh, and naval development, uh, or a grand strategic vision, if you like, uh, where he saw China's uh, naval development in three phases. Uh, the first phase, uh, uh, starting from uh, the year 2000, uh, when China uh, would uh, move out, uh, move its uh, capability, be able to operate. Uh, uh, on, a, on a fairly routine basis and to deny uh, or make it difficult for, for outside powers to operate uh, within that area um, to the first the so-called first island chain which is the which was identified on, on Admiral Otter's uh, uh, slides so we're talking about the Kuril Islands, Japan, the Ryukus, Taiwan, the Philippines, Borneo, etc. The second phase uh, of China's naval uh, development um, aspirational was 2020 was to be achieved by 2020 when when China's navy would move out to the so-called second island chain, the Bonins, the Marianas, the Carolines, and then the third phase would be uh, roughly 2050, uh, by which time China would have become a more, more of a global maritime power and be able to. Uh, operate on more or less a par with the, with the U.S. Uh, Navy. So, you know, if you judge, judge China's naval development by that metric, it looks uh, they're, they're moving more or less as, as on the, the timeline that uh, Admiral Liu uh, outlined. The second, um, uh, the, the second uh, strategic articulation I want to mention is uh, the so-called new historic missions that were announced uh, by then uh, 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 senior leader uh, Hu Jintao as, as uh, in his capacity as chairman of the Central Military Commission in December of 2004. I would just simply note that three of those four uh, new historic missions for the military really emphasize maritime, uh, maritime power and uh, naval uh, uh, emphasize the importance of China's uh, naval development. Uh, one of them, uh, national development, very important economic, uh, economic development essentially, uh, and China uh, being very much integrated into the global economy on, on sea-based uh, trade. Uh, Another one of these uh, new historic missions, so-called new historic missions, national interests. You know, we've heard discussion uh, in the previous panel 
th these are uh, very important, and especially the maritime uh, national interests of, of China. Okay? And lastly, safeguarding world peace. It sounds like propaganda, but and it is, but sometimes propaganda is believed. And, uh, and I think by, by uh, uh, safeguarding a world peace, uh, China means uh, they would like to actively participate in uh, uh, global uh, efforts uh, to maintain uh, things like the sea lines of communication, uh, etc. Et uh, and so this is, this is clearly a, an increased role, uh, suggested increased role uh, for the PLA Navy. Uh, but the most important, uh, when we talk about operational logic or operational uh, missions uh, that uh, China's uh, um, Liaoning uh, aircraft carrier and, and any subsequent uh, carriers will, uh, are expected to, to uh, uh, carry out, it's uh, the most important is, is wartime in uh, wartime uh, capability, power projection capabilities to move uh, any possible fight from beyond China's uh, uh, adjacent seas further out beyond the first island chain and on the, uh, beyond the second island chain. Now, of course, China does not anticipate fighting a war uh, in, the, in the near future. So uh, that while this is, this is important, there are also uh, peacetime uh, op operations uh, that the uh, uh, these aircraft the aircraft carriers are expected to or anticipated to uh, participate in. So the emphasis, increasing emphasis on military operations other than war, as the uh, Ch Chinese uh, put it, emphasizes the importance of uh, of an aircraft carrier in these missions, in including uh, humanitarian assistance, disaster relief uh, efforts. And they've seen uh, U.S. Navy's uh, response in uh, aircraft carriers. Uh, such as the uh, particularly important, I think, was the uh, response to the uh, Southeast uh, Southeast Asian tsunami in 2004. So to uh, you know to, to wrap up, the the paper um, argues that there was an overarching strategic logic, or it wasn't. Uh, let me rephrase that: it wasn't until there was an overarching strategic logic that China's carrier program really really took off. Um, so nationalism, certainly a factor, uh, bureaucratic um, efforts or um, uh, key, key leaders' efforts were, were important, um, but it wouldn't have happened without an overarching strategic logic. I think the acquisition of, of the Liaoning is uh, a very tangible signal of the PLA's um, shift in PLA Navy, naval thinking beyond Taiwan. And what I mean by that is, Few people uh, give credence to the, uh, an aircraft, a Chinese aircraft c carrier playing a key role in a Taiwan scenario. It's other, other scenarios. So th I think this, this suggests that, uh, emphasizes that Chinese um, thinking is, is moving, not that they're ignoring Taiwan, but it's moving uh, beyond, beyond Taiwan. So nevertheless, the PLA is still, I think, m many years away uh, from being able to project and sustain significant uh, naval power, including aircraft carriers, beyond the first and second island chains. But uh, to, to come back to a uh, point that was raised in the last panel, given China's uh, growing um, dependence on imported energy and the importance attached to energy security, a logical priority location for increased uh, uh, PLA naval uh, operational activity is in the Indian Ocean. So that, that the... Uh, oil that comes from uh, the Gulf and Africa uh, can uh, um, concern that that can, that can be uh, trans safely transported uh, back, to, back to China. So final, final uh, couple of uh, final point. Is the aircraft carrier going the way of the battleship? Well, it will likely take uh, decades before such a conclusion that carriers are becoming obsolete uh, can be reached. In the meantime, the Asia, uh, a, excuse me, in the meantime, Asia, or more precisely, the Indo-Pacific, will provide the evidence with which to justify or refute such a judgment on the aircraft carrier. Thank you. <laughs>